Good morning, and it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I had a marvelous day yesterday uh, with a lot of follow-up meetings already scheduled. And I think that's the best indicator of a good conference, and particularly small ones, actually, I think are very conductive to, to personally engage. For today, um, I, I could just present you business numbers and uh, technology of what we are doing at Singron and how we grew from a tiny startup in six years to a company uh, with multiple locations, 700 people uh, in, in China, in Europe, in the US. And I will not do that. I will show you the slides that are usually taken out of business presentations. I will show you the slides that are actually the pictures in my mind when I make decisions on how to scale, how to partner, how to go global, how to judge about a certain situation. And I hope that's more entertaining, it's more ent insightful, and I also hope that you actually have questions either right after the session um, in, in the Q&A or actually any time later today. I will share with you eight observations between the Nordics, Asia, and Europe that are also closely linked to my personal CV uh, of working in, in Asia, working in, in the US, and originally coming from Germany. So I brought you eight stories uh, from that, the red threat on connections, uh, the patient number one, how we moved actually from a technology to something that truly impacted people. I will tell you a little bit about the Singleron story, moving as a startup very quickly and scaling. I'll tell you about relationships and why triangular relationships are the most productive. Um, amalgamation, why, how I see data and life science moving and what that all means for us. Uh, connecting to the Nordics, I'll tell you a story about Iceland and Berlin. Um, I will vote for a different kind of citizenships of the 80-20 land. And in the end, I'll tell you a little bit about what it takes to learn swimming. Global connections. I will later show you a far too busy slide that actually are my connections into, into business and into the world. But I think um, it's, it's not just the analysis of which market is biggest and like it always sounds like in, in a lot of corporate presentations so professional of like um, market growth in this and this country and this is why we moved as a company here and there and how we grow the business. But if we really dig deeper, it's often about personal connections. It's about who can you call in China that you actually have the trust that you can build up uh, your operations in Nanjing or Suzhou? Um, who can you call in the US actually that knows exactly what it takes for your business to generate revenue in the first three years? Um, and that's often the hidden red connections that uh, build the story of why your business actually can grow and scale. And establishing that and finding the right people in conferences like this and many other opportunities I think is crucial. That here is my personal uh, uh, bio. That's my, my lifeline connecting actually different dots across the world. I started in a very small uh, um, city, Bad Salzuflen, uh, in, in, in Germany. Uh, as I found out later on, I grew up in a room actually that was previously inhibited by Hans Kornberg, uh, who lived there actually about 60 years before me. I, for a long time, I didn't know that. Um, his, country, his family had to flee from the Nazis. He became, uh, he moved to the US, he moved to the UK, later to the US, um, met Hans Kornbeck and got the Nobel Prize in biology. Um, so I'm a biologist, there must be something special about this room, that's where my st career started. Um, I'm a scientist turned serial entrepreneur turned investor, so I got an early scholarship to come to the US. I wanted to go there for a year, I stayed for 10 or 12 years. Um, and was very involved, actually, as a young scientist, you think science is the coolest thing, hard science is, as a, biolog as a biologist, you can still talk to like chemists and physics, anything business is not cool, it's not technology, and it was eye-opening for me to be part of the Management of Technology China program uh, at the Haas School of Business at, at UC Berkeley, being teams of four and four MBAs and PhDs, uh, writing business cases of companies that today are slightly bigger, like Baidu or, uh, Alibaba, interviewing the founders and learning from the other side, from the MBAs. And I appreciated actually the smart people on the MBA side as a scientist and how of an interesting chess game it is to understand customers and move every figure exactly in the right way to conduct business and particularly that time in China. Um, 
I started my first company in Singapore after, uh, right after a PhD, uh, Ioxa Biosystems. I won't tell you that entire story that was uh, started 2009. Um, that was a, a jump into cold water by itself. Um, raised about like 50 million as with the background experience of just having uh, conducted your PhD like a year earlier, that was qu quite a journey. With that experience, I was invited. That, uh, that was a proteomics company. I brought it to Germany to the US, uh, and later 2017 was asked by the Singapore government to help other companies, closed a lot of Series A and seed uh, rounds in Singapore, and built up, was an advisor of a company. Two weeks later, I said, hey, this is cool. I will not be your advisor. They said, how about CEO? That's fine. We built up Proteona in 2017, sold it two years ago to Syngron. That's the story. I will tell you a little bit more about it. On the right side, you see, since about a year or one and a half, I found myself being an uh, investor and angel. I thought I'm just sparings partner for young founders. Um, we did 17 investments in the last year. We mean it. We are serious. We want to have entrepreneurs that back up other entrepreneurs, particularly in difficult times. Patient number one. That's a bit of the story of uh, Proteona. We thought we are a research platform combining single cell genomics and proteomics for cool science selling that to academics. We had the opportunity to get a lot of patient data from a patient in Heidelberg. The only reason for that was that the older brother was a professor uh, of that patient that was a multiple myeloma cancer patient. So we had access to any data, uh, any clinical samples. We could take blood samples. And basically, the wish of the family was, well, um, my sister will die. At least we want to do something that helps probably other patients or at least uh, scientific advancement that gives some sense to that. We took this opportunity. We worked with uh, clinicians. We thought we created very cool data, multiple myeloma, as, the, as, as it already says in the name, Multiple myeloma is a very heterogeneous cancer. You have lots of different cancer clones. And whatever therapy you can come up with, you kill some clones and others grow, you have a relapse. That patient had 11 relapses, 11 new therapies. And each therapy is a quadruple therapy. Four different um, uh, um, drugs being used in combination. So you can see it, it's mind-bogglingly uh, complicated. Um, and we basically did an analysis of that on a single cell basis. Our technology platform that time combined genomics, proteomics, very deep AI and, and bioinformatics. And we basically claimed we can predict what therapies should be the best. We thought this is research, that's a cool research tool that will be a science paper or things like that. We sent our predictions back to the head of the Hemonk Clinic at the National University Hospital, National Cancer Center in, in Heidelberg. They said, okay. Um, a few weeks later, well, why don't you come by and, and meet with us? We did. We, we were like in, in front of like a, a bunch of medical doctors. We opened the laptop. They said, close it. It's fine. We've done it. Um, we changed the therapy of that actual patient based on your early preliminary data, and you were right. All of a sudden, we realized, okay, we are not a research platform. And that's what I mean with patient number one. I think we are at the brink of like very data-driven, hyper-personalized, hyper-precise medicine. And that was the awakening point for me. Unfortunately, later that patient died of other complications. But that was all of a sudden what we wanted to achieve with the company, from research tools for academia to being a personalized medicine company, changed our mindset completely. We knew we had to grow faster. We had a lead investor that was significant, uh, Tem Temasek, the National Endowment of Singapore, one of the largest private equity companies uh, in the world. Um, I went out to negotiate uh, supply chain agreements for the various technology parts. I had one conversation with a Chinese CEO, a German uh, um, uh, Chinese CEO, uh, Nanfang, of Syngron. Uh, I started the conversation with, well, this is what we need. Um, this is how you can help us. Uh, let's talk about prices and price points. That was a one-hour conversation. We ended with, hey, we are competing on this. Um, and that's not really working. Let's figure out something better. How about we buy you, was her uh, proposal. I said, actually, that makes sense. Um, and I mean, it, that's also aligned with our vision to grow big, to go fast, um, and to get things done. Within one hour, we agreed on selling the company. 
within three months, we have done everything from due diligence to uh, integrating the teams, creating different spots in different parts of the world, um, and having every contract signed. Yesterday in the panel discussion, I hinted a bit on like China speed. That is China speed. Um, no other European company can act that fast because they have too many precautions, too many forms, too many things that go wrong. In this deal, plenty of things go wrong, plenty of misunderstandings, but all of the things that can be fixed. And I think that's something we have to get used to in Europe. There is an Asian speed, there is a Chinese speed that we have to cater to. And we cannot be stuck in the old processes of like how lengthy it is to, far, like to, to, to deal with the tech transfer office or to partner. Oh, sorry, that's... <clears throat> so what do we do now as Singron? I'll tell you a little bit. Singron is a technology company that does anything from reagents and kits for single cell analysis, uh, targeted sequencing, uh, total sequencing, um, various kits, boxes, devices. We have our own engineering department. Um, we have own software, bioinformatics, and databases. And what is uh, here on the very right side is the, the old stuff from my own company, Proteona, which is bioinformatics, AI, patient-driven decision-making, uh, precision medicine, and particularly interacting with pharma, helping pharma to stratify on the largest clinical trials in cell and gene therapy, for example. A lot of the CAR-T trials run by like the top 10 pharma companies actually work with, with technology solutions from us even though we often cannot talk about that. It makes a lot of sense, and I think it's also, again, like a very Chinese way of thinking about it. We, as a company, simply want to do everything. Singron is a startup. We call ourselves a startup. Just, we, we are six years old, we are fresh, we constantly actually do things differently, just that we are a startup with 700 people. Like, we had an early investment round as well, 150 million for a platform. Uh, just to tell you of like speed and size and, and what actually what kind of wave is actually building up there. That's our locations. And just by the names of the cities, you can already tell like what kind of company we are. Um, so you can see we have two headquarters in China, Nanjing, Suzhou. That means as a company, we understand how things work in China. I think a lot of Europeans think, okay, we'll go to China, where will be our China headquarter? But China is not a country, it's like lots of districts, it's lots of biotech hu uh, hubs, it's lots of provinces, each of them with 100 million people that are the size of like Germany. Um, and they all compete for your business and you have to negotiate with them. Once you're there, it's difficult to negotiate. It's an interesting chess game. If you want to play this well, rather actually negotiate with two at the same time, so you have options. So our headquarter annually changes between Nanjing and Suzhou. I mean, I don't say that in China that loud, but that's a smart way actually of dealing with China. If I tell the Chinese people, they say, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, you got it. Um, for, for Europeans, it's like, oh, we got a really good deal in, in this or this place, we'll go for that. Well, it's, it's a chess game and you have to actually be, be invited and, and play this and also know that and be smart about that. There's nothing bad about it, it's just tough rules. You have an, our technology, I mean, we are a Chinese company and we also heard that yesterday our technology came from Yale University, from one of the leading professors, Rong Fang, uh, in terms of anything single cell omics, platforms and so on. He's one of the big top three probably in the world. He is also originally Chinese, but of course, the, the, the cool technology, the patents, the IP came from there. And I think that's also something that's very typical. Um, um, ben actually said that yesterday as well. Uh, a lot of like the cutting edge technology often comes from the US and from Europe and then grown actually inside a Chinese company. Um, Singapore, I mean, why my old company was from, from Singapore for a Chinese company. It makes a lot of sense to have a hub in in Singapore, because China is a market by itself and works to own rules. Um, serving the rest of Asia is much, much easier from a hub like Singapore. Um, and that's actually why it was very attractive. A lot of our business in Indonesia, in India, in Malaysia is actually run out of Singapore. Um, and China deals with China in a very b difficult way, and that's, I mean, a gigantic market by itself. Um, we are, not at, we are not in Boston, we are not in San Francisco, we are at Michigan because we are price sensitive. Also something you can tell, 
a lot of Chinese companies are price sensitive care. We, our, our colleagues are actually based then in Boston or in San Francisco, but our operations is in, in Michigan. There's not much life science. It's cheap rents. Everything is, is like half the price of the, ba ba uh, the major hubs. Um, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. We have a European hub in Cologne. Uh, Cologne was the birthplace of a lot of like technology platform companies. You know, Kyogen, Miltony, that's all Cologne, Düsseldorf. So it makes also uh, sense. It's a good choice. Um, that slide doesn't need any uh, explanation. Uh, Syngron, we have a little mascot, it's called Simon. Uh, Simon's best friend is my daughter's unicorn. Um, that's uh, our business proposal for the next one or two years. Um, they are good friends, we will be a unicorn. Triangular relationships. That's the picture I have in mind whenever I deal with pharma. And I'll tell you why. Um, for startups, it's ridiculously difficult to get pharma deals. Because it, it always takes, startups, everything has to be fast, you run out of cash, uh, and you have a limited uh, amount of resources. Pharma, they don't even know what they do themselves globally. Um, just the simplest process, last, just the NDA with a material transfer agreement takes a year and multiple approvals, it takes forever. The best way for a startup to, to do uh, a, a, work with Big Pharma is to involve the clinic. Because the one thing pharma can never do without is patients for their trials. And the patients have to come from gifted uh, medical doctors that put that together for the trials. That's, that's the one thing pharma cannot afford, that a trial takes a year longer, because that's billion dollar revenue one year later. So my approach to pharma is finding the doctor, finding the clinical trial that's most relevant for pharma. If I hear presentations of doctors or pharma, I only care about the first slide. The one, you know that slide, the slide that they show for one second. That's where I take a picture. Because um, that's the, the slide actually where the medical doctor says, I have conflicts of interest, these are the pharma companies I work for. And then I look, what kind of trials are they doing? With what pharma companies? What are the timelines? Where are they? What do they need? What's the budget for that? And you can get a lot of that kind of information. And then you think of what does the doctor need? Medical doctors, their, their career strives on being good as medical professions, but also on very, very good publications. Um, if you want to, single cell analysis is still one of the uh, cutting edge topics. Um, we are super efficient in that. That's very data intensive. We have a team. I mean, a lot of universities then have a team of like two or three postdocs that can do the complex bioinformatic modeling. Well, we have 100 people doing nothing else than that every day. So often, actually, we try to engage uh, the, the professor saying, hey, how about a nature, present, uh, nature paper? We can get there in a year. Just look at our track record. Last nature paper from us was like two weeks ago. We, we do top science on a, on a heavy load of bioinformatics. We can run through experiments much faster, but let's present actually what we are doing to pharma together. And that's like if we just would do this with uh, academia, if we would just do it with a doctor, the, the problem is that it will be very good research. Well, we are a company, we have to make money. The one institution that can pay for what we are doing, single cell is super expensive, is pharma. So getting this triangle right means actually good business for us. And by now, I also look at things not just for my own company, but also as an investor. Um, startups that get this right, that make it an a, a equilateral triangle, that understand like, how to engage with clinic and pharma at the same time, actually have a real edge to, to make money, to create a really valuable business that's attractive for, for venture capital. So a lot of presentations I have, I draw a triangle, actually, uh, when I listen to and try to see what is the strongest or the weakest arm. Amalgamation. Amalgam is, I, I think, it's a fascinating material. It's very controversial. None of you would put mercury in your mouse, but actually a lot of us um, had, or at least in the past, had actually material that was a metal and and mercury together, and all of a sudden it's safe. It's also controversial, sure, but I think that's what we see right now in the global life science industry. It's a mixture of 
data science and life science. And anything that's precision medicine, that's personalized medicine, is really coming together of old life science and medical technology together with a new data approach. I see that every day. And the, the difficulty th is not the technology. Remember my patient one story. We can save patients today by combining good data with, um, with cutting edge technology. The question is who makes money there? Like what's the business model? And that's not trivial at all. It's, it's a true challenge. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have right now in the biotech industry, how to make money with that. You hear a lot of buzzwords of AI and very few people actually make money with that. Um, and Springboard Health Angels, uh, our angel network, soon to be a venture capital firm, typically invest exactly in that intersection, like data-driven business, where people can articulate why they have patient data access, why they figured out to work with Charité or with Karolinska and getting like all the kind of data, and everybody is aligned. And on the other side, actually, how does that connect to hard science, patentable, cool uh, drug indications? We as, as investors typically work actually not even so close with the life science investors, which we, the, the typical big ship venture capital firms in life science and in pharma, but often actually with the digital ones, because they all of a sudden want to move into life science. Like Picos is one of the examples. Um, the Picos founders are like probably by now are all billionaires. They are the rocket internet. They are like the delivery hero uh, uh, companies of Germany and made money there and want to move into life science. Different culture, different business models, different questions. They are close partners of what we are doing right now and it's super efficient. But again, it takes the, the, the brave decisions of low ego and let's discuss this together. Um, that was a presentation um, a bit more than a year ago that I started uh, in Berlin. I, I, I was invited to open actually the annual conference of, of Charité and the Berlin Institute of Health, one of the biggest ships in, in, in Germany and in life science. And what I want to point it out here is, don't take yourself too serious. And, And I mean, if you, if you know Berlin a little bit, there are a lot of kinks in that. Like all of them actually, was, was, they, they are so busy actually with fighting with each other rather than getting things done together. And like right before that, I was in Iceland. I was amazed that a small place with like 350, yesterday I was corrected, 380,000 inhabitants can actually stick together, can be convinced to actually, eventually we, have to, we are in the same boat, we are on the same island. We can't afford to fight each other. Let's get things done. Otherwise, we are like a tiny spot in, in, in the world and we have to scale and we have to compete with, with Europe, with Asia, with, with Boston and, and San Francisco. And I think that message gets often lost uh, in, in Germany. Um, so don't take your take, uh, don't fight with each other, don't take yourself too serious, but, but rather actually aim for the big guys like the, the metas and compete with them in a funny way, in an ironic way, but actually compete with them. Berlin should compete with Boston and San Francisco and uh, Shanghai and, and not with Munich. Um, for Iceland, it's obvious you have to scale. Connecting it to the topic of today, go big or stay home, well, you can't stay home. Singapore, where I lived for many years and both of my startups come from Singapore, ha has an amazing track record, 4.5 million people, uh, 1,500 family offices, uh, one of the largest agglomerations of family offices worldwide, tremendous amount of money, and no matter actually what report you look at, one of the leaders in creating startups and, and cool technology, and still, a lot of pitches, I mean, whenever I'm mentoring companies there, scaling globally from day one is a set. Coming back to Germany, it's not. There's a real, go big or stay home is a real question. Um, should I go to the German market first and then to the France or then to UK? There are cases where that makes sense. DIGA, for example, is a German word for like the, the health reimbursement of apps in Germany. Obviously, that's a good business. You probably shouldn't get venture capital for that, but actually a few business angels get it running as a business in Germany. But otherwise, my answer is always, well, you should go big. And I think that's also a bit of message in, in, the, in the Nordics. Go big. 
don't look, there, there are business cases where it makes sense to look into your own economy, but otherwise have a strategy early on of like, how does it impact uh, the, the world stage in, in, in China, in, in, in all of Europe, in the US, all of your solution. But in this medium-sized uh, places, I can speak more confident about Germany than about the Nordics, there is a real question and it has to be addressed. Yesterday I mentioned already, uh, we the citizens of 8020 land, what I wish for is a bit more 8020 mentality, making quick decisions. Don't go for the professionalism um, that Germany has, for example, of being obsessed with doing the best thing. And learning to swim, have calculated risk. I was this boy as well, uh, you were that boy or girl there as well. The only mistake you can make here is to just stay on that board. It's okay to go down if you don't want to take the risk. Or you have to jump, but you have to make a decision. And that's something I desire to have more in Germany, in the Nordics, and in all of Europe. Make bold decisions and move. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.